world ruled by the dead, we are forced to finally start living. This is the synopsis for The Walking Dead. It's found on the back of every trade paperback, as well as being used in the final issue by Judge Michonne Hawthorne for the court case surrounding Carl Grimes, who after killing one of Herschel Green's personally owned walkers, commenting on how far society has progressed to a point that the undead is sold as a travelling novelty and not the world-ending threat they once were. Part of it can be seen as a metatextual nod to the decline of zombies in the mainstream zeitgeist, but in a much broader sense, it also shows the radically different circumstances we find many of these characters in. Some have grown into proactive individuals who are key parts of a community, while others have regressed, who seem radically different from their initial appearance over 190 issues ago. Considering the initial, much bleaker ending, it could have been tempting to end it all basking in misery, echoing Rick Grimes' statement in issue 24, We are the walking dead. It wouldn't be out of the question given how straight up nihilistic these books could get, not just in the violence but in the many ways other humans could hurt each other, all shown in a monochromatic black and white art style that made every act feel infinitely harder to stomach. Something series creator Robert Kirkman spoke of as his main drive behind creating the story. I've always strived to be as brutal as I believe this world could get and not shy away from things, for better or for worse. A lot of very rough things happen throughout the comic's near 16 year run, and if you're upset by any of these topics on screen, like here's a list, well here's your chance to click off now. Or don't, I'm not your dad. What's fascinating in retrospect isn't how the post-apocalyptic zombie epic reached its conclusion, instead it was that for a while, it was unlikely to even get off the ground in the first place. To talk about that though, we need to go back before Negan, before the show, even before issue 1 was released to the public, and talk about a little publication with a certain vowel-shaped logo. In the near 90 year long history of American comics, Image hasn't actually been around that long, having only been founded as recently as 1992. But at the same time, it's hard to think of any independent publisher that came right out the gate with an immediate impact on its industry. Much like Sega of the time challenging the status quo of the video game market, Image Comics were the sledgehammer to the brick wall that Marvel and DC had spent their existence building up. The mindset up until this point was more focused on the brand rather than the individuals. For so much of comics history, what was sold were the characters. You'd pick up a Superman comic because it was the Man of Steel, not for the person who wrote or drew it. Image became the home to those writers and artists who had control of their work, while admittedly a lot of their output would fall under that 90s extreme look that favoured pure visual punch over storytelling, what they represented was a freedom that would open the floodgates to a host of creator focused stories that could be tailored the way they wanted. Chew isn't a comic I have much affection for personally, but you would never see a premise as unusual in a more conservative publication, or something like Saga, which is such a towering example of what this medium can be, couldn't be sold anywhere else. <laughs> Except that wasn't the case for Robert Kirkman, who after multiple failed pitches was repeatedly told that his little zombie comic wouldn't be viable to a mainstream audience for being too normal. Oopsie whoopsie, we did a fucky wucky. That was until he came up with a hook, showing that the cause of the zombie plague was to come from, and brace yourself, aliens. That last bit obviously didn't happen, but it's weird to think that everything that followed in its wake, the games, TV shows, merchandise, and becoming one of the biggest properties on the planet, might not have happened. But it did, and The Walking Dead became one of the biggest independent comics of all time, and for a while, one of my all time favourites. See, I've been reading comics since I actually could read, but this was the first one that would properly kickstart my love for the medium. The only stuff we had around my house at that time was this Simpsons collection, as well as what my local library had in stock, which mainly consisted of a worn down copy of The Force Unleashed, and also Spider-Man Rain. Like Jesus Christ, that thing is so edgy cut yourself just by looking at it. But for the first time, I felt like I was reading something that was geared specifically for me. Remember, this was back when zombies were at the height of their popularity. They were the selling point of anything you could put them on, because their appeal is universal. Unlike many of the more classical monsters like werewolves or vampires who feature a supernatural power over standard human beings, zombies 
for as small as they seem, they often represent many of our deepest insecurities. There is no grace or theatricality to their appearance, in fact, they are intentionally stripped of any individuality which defines every living person. But it's also that more tactile, vulnerable nature which makes them more manageable. As Simon Pegg put it, You don't have to be Van Helsing or even Peter Venkman to throw down with a zombie. Anyone with a pulse can step up, you just need your wits and a weapon. The concept for the undead is rooted in our morbid fascination of seeing humanity at its worst. So while many would look down on the subgenre as a cheaper form of entertainment, in the right hands it can serve as a blank canvas for whatever an author wants it to be. Whether it's done for drama or comedy, it can serve as a blank canvas for whatever an author wants it to be, subject to time as well as the era of its release. While Kirkman has said he doesn't consider it a horror comic, that much like the best zombie fiction, it goes beyond the blood and guts to be something more thoughtful and can offer something a person takes into their own life. With this in mind, it wouldn't be right if I didn't talk about that first encounter just over a decade ago. Which means I will have to stop using these books as a stand for my microphone and actually open them up. In 2012, during a young enterprise fair with my school, we manned a table in the local shopping centre, and every half an hour, our teacher would allow two of the six pupils to go visit some of the other stalls. On one of these breaks, the person I was with went off to Starbucks, and I ducked into the local Eason's. And there, tucked away in a corner, sat Volume 1, Days Gone By. I read it all in one sitting, and immediately, I knew I was hooked. Needing to get that next fix, I asked my dad to take me back to the previously mentioned Easons that Saturday, which would actually turn into something of a weekly ritual, where I'd get him a copy of the Irish News, and I'd browse this section which was later rebranded into Department 51, picking up the likes of Full Metal Alchemist, Kick-Ass, Preacher, Scott Pilgrim, and of course, The Walking Dead. These were the volumes I got from that previously mentioned shop, this was the one I got from that trip to Dublin, if you remember what happened in this volume, I am deeply sorry. And these last two I got from the Forbidden Planet near my college. Basically, for the entirety of my adolescence, this series was with me, and watching it go from a small-scale story of a group of characters just trying to survive that eventually expands into a whole world of different factions, ideologies, and points of view is deeply satisfying. It's a world that never feels like it bends towards the main characters, instead feels entirely indifferent towards them. The few moments of genuine happiness are fleeting, and more often than not, don't last. People can die, and entire establishments can fall apart in an instant. This doesn't sound like anything special, just standard genre fare, but reading this at 13 years old, all of these story beats felt monumental. Being a teenager is this point in life where every emotion is apocalyptic, your mood swings erratically and everything is becoming bigger with every passing day. It can be overwhelming, which is why I found a comfort in seeing these people persevere, sometimes failing, but still getting up to fight another day. It felt like you could take on the world yourself, which was the kind of escapism that resonated with me and so many others. For a comic that was deemed too normal to be successful, I feel one of the series' core strengths is in that mundanity, which goes into the writing of its many characters. While some are certainly more developed than others, as well as progression being intentionally slow, there's an effort put into making these people feel like they've existed long before we've ever met them. Whether it's the romance that forms between Maggie and Glenn, to Andrea growing from a law clerk into a sharpshooting badass, each arc adds to their progression, with some ending up in radically different places from when we first met them. As slow as the story could move, it is always moving, and in my eyes it's always been more about the journey rather than the destination. All of this is written well, but being a comic is of course shown to us as well. Which brings us to the thing you've probably noticed, is that the entire story is illustrated in black and white. What at first seems like a limitation actually turns into a vital tool for its style of storytelling. More than just paying tribute to the work of George A. Romero, the monochromatic style succeeds because the very lack of colour provides a mysterious, more interpretive quality to the compositions, giving it a more timeless feel. In the age of colour where every aspect of a frame can be retooled to be exactly the way an editor wants, the appeal of black and white imagery comes from its simple, analogue approach. It's entirely reliant on the use of shadows and contrast to form the composition, it has a hidden quality that makes it more alluring. There's a quote from a photographer that beautifully sums up this point, but since I don't want to butcher their name, I'm just going to show what they say here. As black and white film does not have any colour, light stands out. Therefore, when I shoot monotone, I would study the change of lights and contrast. 
Without colors, the details and emotions of the subject are easier to catch. Penciler and inker Charlie Adler, alongside Cliff Rathburn providing the grey tones, gives the comic this hazy yet detailed feel, making the romantic moments feel intimate and the horror genuinely unpleasant. That lack of colour causes our imagination to fill in the gaps. It's why the deluxe re-release doesn't have the same impact for me personally. While I'll admit there is a certain catharsis to seeing some of these moments realised in colour, much like Scott Pilgrim which I read around the same time, I know these images won't have the same impact as the original print, because I know so many of these iconic moments by hand, and seeing them in colour I don't think would add anything because the emotion was always there. A lot of these moments are what makes up the experience of reading The Walking Dead. The series is littered with these moments that capture these raw emotions. They can be funny, they can be scary, they can be intimate, they can be whatever they want to be because we are given the time, the space, and the emotion to feel through the compositions because we are there. And the best example of this visual language comes from probably its most infamous. It's its most scary, it's its most cruel and it's at its best here. Let's talk about issue 100. This in our pants yet? This was the comic that introduced Negan. This was the issue that killed Glenn, and this was the comic firing on all cylinders. Editor Cena Grace pulls together each panel into an encounter drenched in so much tension you could drown in it. Whether it's a close-up of a weapon or a wide establishing shot showing how large yet contained this ambush is, the focus is entirely on the expressions of anger, fear, and sheer sadistic joy on each character's face. What's most striking about this encounter is the way Adler and Kirkman are willing to hold on a series of panels. Whether it is the previously mentioned close-ups, or just a repeat of a previous composition, it doesn't let us escape this situation, we are stuck in it with the characters. It makes every page turn an agonizing experience. Glenn is chosen, and it's not pretty. There is no escape, there is no chance to look away. All you can do is turn the page and see what happens. It. Anybody moves, anybody says anything, cut the boy's other eye out and feed it to his father, and then we'll start. You can breathe, you can blink, you can cry. Hell, you're all gonna be doing that. After it's all done, we are left to sit in the aftermath of what happened. Something so unpleasant just happened right in front of us. Yet like everything else in The Walking Dead, there's a part of you that still wants to push on to see what happens next. This was just one moment in the series that would stick in my head for years to come. I could pick up any volume and still remember a particular scene or dialogue exchange, whether it's the first six issue run illustrated by Tony Moore or the monumental All Out War story arc, it took 100% of my attention and for an hour or so, all life's worries were gone. These books were important to me back then, and in a lot of ways they still are, but as you've probably noticed in the thumbnail, I called it when The Walking Dead was my favourite comic. If I made this a few years ago, that hypothetical video would have ended here. The thing is, even before the series' abrupt conclusion, I had this slight sinking feeling that the narrative wasn't hitting as much as it used to. And not because of some drop in quality, although I do feel that was quite evident in some of the later arcs. But instead how things had just started to change with growing up. I stopped watching the show around season 7 because there were other shows that started to speak to me more, that were more consistent in their quality and had moments that resonated with me harder. 
I still enjoyed the Telltale games, but I finished it more out of an obligation rather than the same love I had for that first entry. Along with the simple fact I had started college and was meeting new people to connect with, it let me see that the world was a much bigger place than I had up until this point. I don't want to say I outgrew The Walking Dead, instead I just broadened my taste. During one's formative years, we have a tendency to latch onto something that feels familiar which gives us a sense of comfort. I mean, I had a phase where I listened to Nightcore. Some things are just better left in the past. I mean, has anyone actually played Balloon Tower Defense outside of secondary school? I'm not even sure teenagers today know what those things are or even what miniclip is. Which is now the world we're stuck in. Back in March, I was at Dublin Comic Con doing press photography for the event, and two of the guests that were featured were Chandler Riggs and Michael Cudlitz, who played Carl and Abraham on the AMC show respectively. If this was 2016 or 17 when I had just started going to these events, I would have been hyped, but now I was busy, I had panels to attend, photos to take and friends to meet. I will say though, they did seem like perfectly nice people, and overall it was still a fun time. One person that did stick out though, wasn't actually a guest, it was a cosplayer who went as Jesus. And no, I'm not talking about gay icon Jesus, I'm talking about the actual Jesus, you know, your lad who was on the cross. I talked with the Lord about our shared interest in The Walking Dead, as well as other comics we were into like Berserk. This Jesus was rad in my book. A lot of it was that kind of casual chit chat in the past tense, and I came to this conclusion, that the things we love may not have the same power as they once did, but they're always going to be there. I think we've all had that experience where the right piece of media just comes into your life, and in that moment, it gives you what is needed, like a nice meal after a long day of work. Looking around at the lasting impact of the comic, it's clear through all the violence, death, and copious amounts of heartbreak, there was something so intrinsically satisfying to keep pushing forward to see what happened next. I'm not going to pretend that the comic was perfect, it had its pacing problems, lesser developed characters, and the final story arc is honestly not great, and I can't ever see myself going back to try and read it anytime soon. Because it's no longer the only comic I read anymore, I hadn't touched the likes of JoJo's, Watchmen, or dived into the world of webtoons with the likes of Lore Olympus, Heartstoppers, or Misguided Ghosts. Putting it simply, it's just not my favorite comic anymore. What it means to me now is different from when I first read it back in 2012. It launched me into discovering some of the best stories that I've ever consumed. Narratives that combine both words and visuals into something personal yet highly accessible. In the last few years, there's been a lot of talk, especially in the film sphere, about what counts as true art. And personally, I think what you get out of a piece of media, regardless of its quality, is more important than some objective critical standard that everyone must feel the same on, because frankly, that's boring. And it is those individual perspectives that are infinitely more interesting. It may not be my favorite comic anymore. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's still The Walking Dead. Whether it's by page, screen, or controller, it's still one of those stories that gave me hope in a time when it seemed hard to find. And while I might have mixed thoughts on the final story arc, it's in issue 191, I believe this is summed up in its purest form. Rick Grimes, missing a hand, losing his second wife, and on the verge of another war that could wipe out everything that has been built up, does only what he can do. Standing in the center of two opposing sides, ready to revert back to killing each other, he makes a speech that rallies people together rather than tear them apart. Words that prove a democracy can be reached. A phrase that throughout every bit of pain and loss can unite everyone together. Those words are, 